What is up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Meaning of Podcast. This is the podcast where we get into the deeper meaning of your favorite film directors. I am Ace. This is RB3. And we're going to be talking about Zack Snyder, um, what some people call our Lord and Savior, Zack yeah, Snyder. <laughs> yeah. uh, Zack Snyder has a lot of fans. So yeah, we, we are, in, in anticipation for Justice League, we really want to talk about uh, he's a for for a guy who doesn't have a lot of movies. He's a very divisive filmmaker, oh, yeah. to say the least. So I'm very much excited to get into that for sure. But first of all, I want to know how you're doing today, RB3. How are you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing great, man. I'm here. Uh, you know, made the trip. Train was a little behind, so got things you. got a little out of whack. But I'm excited to do a Zack Snyder episode. How's your? You you just ran a marathon, right? Like, yeah, I, yeah, I did. I did. It was a. Uh, it was something. <laughs> let's not talk about that uh, okay. in fact let's jump into the comment section because we want to read your previous comments from last week's episode where we talked about mcu films and mcu films are obviously very popular right. so i'm very curious to read these comments right now because you guys left a few on the youtube section and if you guys want to leave us a comment make sure you do we'll be reading them yeah. also on the schmoville post as well i make a post on schmoville um asking you guys what your thoughts and opinions are and you can comment on that as well but first um i'm going to start out with a comment from mr danny allen danny allen danny experience allen. he says RLM said it best. Marvel Studios equals McDonald's at this point. Wow. RB3, your response? Um, no, nah, I mean, I guess, I mean, they, they, it, it is kind of like a fast food, I guess, of filmmaking, but I don't think that's uh, necessarily a bad thing. I enjoy McDonald's. And I, I enjoy actually Marvel, kind of, so. I kind of feel like the commodity. It's, it's very, it's very insulting, though. It's like, it's condescending it to is. what Marvel uh, is kind of doing. I actually, I don't want to say this because it's going to freak everyone out but i feel like the commoditization of mcdonald's and it's it's more felt with like the new lucas film i think that's a oh, little really? bit more at least okay. at least with products like sanitized like kind no of. i i just feel like lucas film is is they're just so concerned with products uh, you see what i'm right, saying like making a toy like, or... uh star wars lipstick star wars this right, star wars handbag right. star wars clothes star wars like did you hear about the new um star wars line um it's oh, called uh, rat, rat and what yeah, is it called? yeah 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 isn't it like rag Forever and bone 21 or something like that or? no it's called rag and bone um oh. and it's a really cool like super trendy new york uh, mm. brand i think it's new york um and it's called rag and bone and it's really high end but they made a star wars like version of their clothes like oh. a star wars section oh, okay. I didn't know merchandise this. dude i was like that looks really cool i'm gonna buy it guess what guess where the prices start what? it's like three grand really for 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 like a high end like star, star wars, wars costume <laughs> and it's like uh, I don't know. For me, it's like that kind of shows where they're going, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, I disagree with you, Danny. I think the MCU movies can vary, especially with Thor Ragnarok, as I previously stated on this episode. Um, movie Ace says, Civil War is the most overrated movie of all time. Wow. So many glaring plot holes and a ridiculous story. Iron Man and Guardians Volume 1 are by far the best. Um, so Civil War, I mean, I enjoy the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it had a lot to say. There's Social surprisingly a lot of comments that didn't like Civil War. Well, I think it's the hype factor. I think it's the hype factor. People going in were saying, I remember reading a lot of reviews and watching a lot of critics kind of saying, oh, this is the best MCU movie of all time. This is the best Marvel movie. Best action scene is the, you know, airport sequence of all time. You know, I thought that was, and I think people going into it had that high expectation level. So when you go in and see the movie that you were presented, you know, of course you're going to be a little disappointed if you're going in thinking it's a 10 out of 10 best picture winner. You know what I mean? So I, I, I do. And I, I, I do get what you mean. And that's a good point too. Dude. I, I feel like that airport scene is what everyone talked about, but that yeah. wasn't my favorite part of the movie at yeah. all. I, I thought if you take that out of the movie and just put in like another action scene, I think it works either way. I mean, it's cool. It's cool to see, yeah. but I feel like the story is what drives that movie more. Yeah, yeah. And I think the the dilemma that's presented, uh, like the character decisions and all that, I think that's what, it, again, I think that's what makes the movie so interesting to me um, as a viewer. And, you know, looking at it, I mean, of course, and it's also coming off the fact that it was coming after The Winter Soldier, which a lot of people do consider, even like non-comic book geeks consider that a, a great movie. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it was even getting some Oscar push for it, I think, at one point. So, was it really? Damn. Yeah, That's yeah. breaking news to me. Wow. Yeah, I think, well, I think I think that well, it was mostly Disney trying to push for <laughs> Oscars, right? But it wasn't like, you know, a lot of people saw it as sure. a film that could transcend a lot of the superhero genre. And, you know, I know you didn't like, you know, Winter Soldier as much. So. I, I liked it a yeah. lot. I just 
just yeah. it took me out of that. The, the, the computer, yeah, the yeah, computers, yeah, it really yeah. did. Now, that's understandable, but yeah. Th- so I think coming off of a great second movie, that's what they were um, expecting. Yes, yeah, what they're expecting, and of course, you having all of these characters in um, is going to disappoint some people. Sure. So. Um, Gunslinger one ninety nine says. I have big problems with Age of Ultron, but I kind of miss Joss. The MCU is getting way too comedic right now, and Joss brings a good balance between the drama and comedy for me. I hope the Rooster Brothers deliver with Infinity War. Funny you say that, because I feel the exact opposite. (laughs) I feel like Joss did it great in the first Avengers and really dropped the ball in Age of Ultron. I know you disagree with me, I think, but I feel like... I agree. it, It didn't... It just didn't work. It, it, the, the, the really high stakes of what was going on and the really quippy lines of a Joss Whedon script for Age of Ultron just didn't work. And I feel like now it allows a film director like a James Gunn and like a Taika Waititi to literally mold their own version of what an MCU film is. And I, I like that. Whether some people may say it's too comedic, but to me that's just a vision of a director. Whereas like Joss's vision got a little bit muddled with Age of Ultron, at least I feel personally. No, no I, nothing against Joss. I think he's I mean obviously I'm a huge Buffy fan. Right. But specifically with Age of Ultron, I just felt like Ooh, this is so much Joss on the screen that it doesn't have anything else. No, I, I agree to to a lot of what you're saying. I think there is, uh, I, again, I, I think I said in the last episode too, but my problem with Age of Ultron was just that it looks like a dark movie, it's shot like a dark movie, um, but they play it as a comedy. Mm-hmm. I think if it would have had the same kind of bright, vibrant feel of the first Avengers, it would have worked a lot better, and they wouldn't have tried to play up this whole dark villain thing. And I think part of that's attributed to the marketing too. Um, the trailers that came out made it look like this is the darkest MCU movie you're ever going to oh, see. Oh, yeah. Um, and when you watch the movie, it's not that. You get quippy James Spade. You get the same... It's, pretty much almost a lot of the same beats as the first Avenger story wise. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it's supposed to, they make it look and feel so dark um, that the light moments just don't work that well. Um, but I think that what you, what when we're talking about the balance of the MC, I think that's, that's a little bit different. And, you know, the way Joss handled that and the first Avengers worked really well. Um, but I think the direction that they're going in now is so different. I think they're almost kind of dividing the universes to some extent mm. where you have the Guardians and the Thors. Kind cosmic. Of, yeah, the Cosmic having a more comedic angle, whereas the stuff on Earth is built up to a point to where it needs to be a little more high stakes, a little more sure. dramatic where the Russo brothers are playing in. Sure. Um, and even even the stuff on Earth being set, like the 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 spider-man homecoming uh still has comedic moments a lot of the mcu movies that are set on earth still have comedic moments but there's there's a difference now um and i think the direction that joss was going in was a little different than the the way they want to go um going forward it's so interesting that we're bringing up joss now and we have a Zack snyder episode knowing that justice league is coming out this week Mm. and it's one of those things too where it's like it's such a weird meshing of the two that i'm still nervous that it might not work to be completely honest i'd rather see a full Zack snyder Justice League movie. I agree with then that. Then to see a Zack Snyder meets Joss Whedon, smash it together, and hopefully it comes out good. Like that to me just makes me super nervous. Let's do one more comment real quick. Uh, Mike Johnson says, This is the first meeting of podcasts I listen to. I really enjoy Ace and RB3 together. I will definitely be watching the previous six episodes. This made me want to create my own fa- uh, my own favorite MCU list. My top is Captain America Winter Soldier. Thank you, Mike Johnson. We appreciate you. Um, Thank you hopefully yeah. you enjoy the previous episodes to let us know what you thought. Uh, yeah, Winter Soldier. It's what everyone pretty goes pretty much goes to. Yeah, that was a, that was what a lot of people um, mentioned in the comments. I think is their favorite. And I mean, you know, again, I think that's the movie that coming out the time that it came out um, meant a lot to a lot of people. Again, with the NSA stuff, we're, we're the Patriot Act. We're caring more and more about issues of national security um, now more than ever. And uh, and that came out right at the peak of that. So sure. All right, enough MCU, guys. Let's move on to what we're all here for, DCU, Uh a.k.a. Zack Snyder, a.k.a. the one who's going to save us from these other superhero movies. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's talk about Zack Snyder, man. He's obviously, we're talking about him because of Justice League. Uh, He's a director who's very divisive for some weird reason because I'm interested to do this episode mainly to find out why he's so divisive because I think he's so fascinating in the sense of his divisiveness of how many people either 
really, really love him or really, really hate him and then kind of make their own version of him to fit it. It's almost like a, I know it sounds weird, but it's almost like a religion where it's like, take these little pieces of the Zack Snyder Bible and you have this denomination and then take these little pieces and you have that Zack Snyder denomination. He's just a weird, he, he creates a weird fandom around him, if that makes any sense. Right. But but I really want to know, obviously, this is called The Meaning of Podcast. What is the meaning of Zack Snyder to you personally? Well, I mean, to me, Zack Snyder represents a lot of different things, a lot of different angles. Um, you know, he he came from a history of doing commercials, music videos, kind of the same way that we saw in previous directors like Edgar Wright and David Fincher. Fincher yeah. um, but Zack Snyder, I, I believe he graduated from the same school as Michael Bay, like literally the same college. So they come from the same kind of brand of filmmaking, whereas... I feel like Zack Snyder differs, though, is the way he presents uh, his films, the way he, he uh, his influences kind of step more to the forefront. He's very he very much has a style that's desaturated colors, um, slow motion. He's he, he has a lot of influences, whether that be like really Scott um, in terms of the palette that he works in or um, Spielberg when it comes to like the way his camera moves, the way he kind of follows characters um, visually. And I think that what makes Zack Snyder so I think he's a visionary filmmaker first off I think he's he's great at what he does I think he's an efficient storyteller and I think that um you know one of the reasons that he he is so divisive is because he is so willing to put um the subject matter to the forefront and make movies feel like movies and I think there's not a lot of directors that do that these days um what do you mean movies feel like movies well I believe that uh, he to me what what he stands out as making a film to make you feel like you're watching him film okay. you know what i mean he has uh whether that be his slow motion techniques whether that be his snap zooms or his action zooms or you know and when you're watching something like man of steel it feels like oh this isn't like a clean cut like story that we're like following this is a movie that if there was a superman on earth and somebody was trying to film him make a documentary basically of that character this is how it would kind of look like and i think that's what makes it very very interesting i think he has a quote where he says he likes to immerse um he wants he wants movies to feel like um cinema because uh while immersing the audience into a story because that way you could you know you it's like a level of transparency and and and, and his work and i think that's what a lot of the great artists in general do um whether that be alan moore he had a similar quote about comic books he wants comic books to feel like comic books uh whether that be you know classic painters like picasso or whatnot a lot of what you see in great artists is that they want to transcend and have some sort of self-reflectiveness in their work sure. i think Zack snyder brings that to the forefront a lot and i think that's one of the most underrated qualities yeah uh, to me so absolutely yeah i mean Zack snyder is a guy who he made his first feature film was Following the step of a giant with uh, Dawn of the Dead. Oh right, right. It's a I mean, remake of uh, George A. Romero's uh, classic. That's so. absolutely like you, you imagine if someone says, "Hey, your first movie is going to be a follow up to a classic movie right. that everyone loves," right? And that's very much you know has a lot to say. That's a big footsteps to follow. But it's funny because it, when you see the writing credits on that movie, James Gunn, James Gunn, yeah. and George A. Romero. George A. Romero, yeah. So it's kind of crazy to see that they picked Zack Snyder to to kind of show their vision of what of Dawn of the Dead is. I want to hear your thoughts on this movie because it came out in I think oh four. Yeah, two thousand four. Yeah. And it very much was like you know a new recreation of the original movie, which it doesn't really follow the original movie uh, to no, a no point. none at all yeah actually, it's mainly just set in a mall which is the same thing as the original movie exactly yeah and i have watched the original um kind of both as the we did the horror episode a couple weeks ago and knowing that we're going to do Zack snyder um i want to go back and check up on the original and the original had a lot of great social commentary in there mm -hmm. um it was all about consumerism it was all about you know it was set in the mall um, so their whole idea was that a lot of like these zombies are just mindless people who are here when they have nowhere else to go. Sure. Um, so, and you have a lot of, you have a stronger focus on character in the original film as well. Um, 
And of course, you also have this another trope of George A. Romero have an African American leader, a hero, um, and Peter. Um, so for um, and Zack Snyder remaking it, he takes all of the social commentary out. Uh, he takes all of the as far um, as consumerism. So too. as far as consumerism, yeah. As far as uh, there's one comment in there, but I I, I was trying to find it because I was like, where is it? Where is it? There's one comment where CJ, because I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure we watched it. CJ says like, don't steal anything, but it's kind of it. Yeah. There's not really any other line that says, hey, you know, the world's ending, but you got to look pretty or something like that. Right, but there, right. There, there was one little moment, but it's so vague that it doesn't really hit. Really yeah, well. yeah. It wasn't, and that wasn't what it was about, frankly. I mean, the first sure. one was kind of a commentary on consumerism and um, mindless spending and whatnot. And whereas this film was just a straight up action horror movie um, and i think this is the most different film that Zack snyder's ever made too yeah it's um, kind of it's kind of odd because i've obviously i rewatched it as well and yeah. I, I felt like the the thing that kind of took me out of it sometimes was the tone because mm. you felt like you just saw something serious and then some goofy song plays and then there's a montage of people you know, did you remember that montage yeah, scene? Yeah, it made it made me feel like, what's go, what's going on? What happened? Is what it, was this weird? <laughs> right, right. And like, it, it's great. It's a great montage scene. Yeah, but it but it it's odd. It kind of takes you out of it's it. It's so weird that this and Shaun of the Dead came out in the same year. Yeah, you could almost feel like if if Dawn of the Dead had pushed it just a slightly a more more ridiculous because yeah. it is kind of a ridiculous movie. Like there is some winking at the camera mm-hmm. with characters like CJ, mm-hmm. with Andy, right. with with like the shotgun, with like a bunch of different moments. It does have like with a freaking Ty Burrell. What's Ty Burrell, Ty, yeah. Like yeah. He, he's winking at the camera the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his character is a giant wink. Right. But um, so there is some of that but at the same time it still j- draws back to like an original action horror like you said. Yeah. But what do you think of the weird meshing of the tones i mean i like it i think it gives it a little bit of a value to what we're seeing it gives us you know this is a movie that has so many characters that um it, i think instead of trying to make you connect to every single character it just gets you connected to the group sure to the whole atmosphere of it and when something comes up to disrupt the group that's when you start to feel some real emotion sure in there um but to to the comedic effect, yeah, I think that really works because you get you get a lot of moments of levity and, and uh, what was that one scene where they were like shooting the zombies and uh, where oh yeah where, where Andy, Andy was shooting in yeah. and uh, Vin Rains I forget his character's name but he would like write like celebrities yeah. names and just like hold it up yeah have them shoot, Jay Leno so. Rosie Jay Leno. O'Donnell yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I and, thought and, that and was... as I watched that scene and being a fan of The Walking Dead uh, I I think like Rick now and I'm like waste of ammo you need that ammo <laughs> but then again he's in a gun store so I was like all right that's how they justify it that he has unlimited ammo right but uh but yeah that scene that's a very interesting like odd scene too. yeah yeah <laughs> but uh i want to talk about the opening credits to this movie we had a long conversation when we talked about david fincher about opening credits mm-hmm. and how that's so uh artistic and important and i feel like it's really cool in films when they yeah. do it right what do you think of this opening credit so it's got basically a montage of the world ending in the zombie apocalypse and it's right. got that that song to me johnny cash Ooh. yeah what is it called the the man coming? the man i think left the, or something yeah yeah the oh. man's coming yeah and it, it's basically talking about uh, the book of revelations yeah which is just talking about what's going to happen the in the apocalypse book of, yeah. the four horsemen the apocalypse um the day god comes back the rapture revelation yeah, it, it's all of it, yeah. it, but he's it's in johnny cash's signature voice yeah and johnny cash is one of the most ethereal vocalists ever it, like he's he can transport you to a feeling to to an emotion to a to a place just by singing a few lines in his signature voice mm-hmm. and and the fact that he's singing about the apocalypse while we see the apocalypse happening mm-hmm. is so like it like makes you feel so much already within four minutes of just the montage. What do right. you think of that opening? I mean, that's the Zack Snyder, man. I mean, yeah. that's the music video kind of yeah. where, where it comes from. So he's able to evoke a lot of the emotion that that song is bringing, coupled with the subject matter. And like the whole found footage, like news angle mm-hmm. of, of it makes it feel real, like we're about to go into it. And, and um, you know, and, and of course, you know, establishing all of the establishing that opening sequence with um 
Sarah Poli's character. I can't remember her name. I don't remember her name either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But having that whole that oh, whole the horrifying scene of losing her family like in five minutes. Already. Yeah, yeah. And she has to jump into action just like that. Yeah. So having that coupled with that opening credits is like you feel you feel it on a global level, but also on a personal level. Sure. Um. So it was like a nice one-two punch. Um. In that sense. Yeah. So, for sure. Uh, yeah. I want to talk about too. Um. Uh, one of my favorite parts of zombie movies and zombie films and zombie shows, I talked about it when we talked about Shaun of the Dead, was the idea of leadership, mm. right? It's all, it, anytime the the zombie apocalypse happens, whether it's Rick Grimes, whether it's Shaun and Shaun of the Dead, there is like a leader that rises up and shows that he can take charge of a group. And this happens a lot in this movie, whether it be CJ of the, in charge of the security right. guard, yeah. whether it be, um, oh, crap, I forget the homeboy's name. Um Dang it. I forget his name. Which but uh, uh, the, the first white guy that we see. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I can't remember his name either. But he was like the, he was the, like the, he was like the loser kind of dude in the beginning. Sure. Um, but then he kind of transforms into. Yeah. And he, yeah. he kind of does that whole leadership thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or whether it be um, freaking a uh, cop, yeah. police officer, shock. Oh, yeah. Vin, Ra- Vin yes, Rimes. Yes. Yeah. Vin Rimes. And yeah, it, it's all these either. like meshing of leaderships of who should lead how they should lead whether where cj is like very much like already in that like mindset of like don't trust anyone shoot anyone who doesn't trust you lock him up because people are going to turn vicious that kind of mindset mentality um and then you have the other guy who's like well let's show mercy let's see what happens you know Mm -hmm. what do you think of the whole leadership dynamic because i adore that stuff i think it's so fascinating because it's so realistic humanity no matter what happens we're always going to turn to someone that we feel is alpha, we, we, who we feel we can trust. And that's like a leader. All right. So what do you think of that aspect in this film? No, I, I agree to uh, completely. I mean, I think that's why we become invested in a lot of these people, because we see them develop into a form of, uh, of leaders um, in their own individual ways. And even if they're not necessarily like charging the group or or taking a stand, they all have a, a bit of individual growth to where, you know, we we have moments with them. Um, you know, every character has like their standout moment of being able to shine, being able to um, provide for somebody else, being able to help other other people in the group. So, um, and you know, and having and building to a lead, like you said, there's there's also a point of having everybody build to one leader and how. Uh, you know, changing up and, and switching. It, 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 yeah, absolutely. It, it, how they switch sides and how they evolve as a person through right. the whole apocalypse. The biggest example of that is when you first meet CJ, who's played by uh, Michael Kelly, who plays a Duck Stamper in House of Cards. I don't know oh, if you know oh, that. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Who I love so much. I freaking love Whoa, the guy. Oh, yeah. I didn't even yeah. I didn't even I make saw the it connection. as soon as I rewatched yeah. it. I was like, that's Doug Stamper. That's the MVP right there. But I, I like him because he starts out as like the really, really big asshole typical like uh-huh. you know stereotypical like, like douchebag redneck, kind of, redneck yeah. kind of dude who's like oh i don't care i'm gonna do whatever i want and it's like you know after being forced to work within a group he becomes like low-key the mvp of the group mm-hmm. at the end of the movie i don't mm-hmm. know if you remember the mm-hmm. the ending but he's taking out zombies left and right this homeboy is like there dude the right. fact that he one of my favorite scene when he throws the gas tank yeah he's like give me the gun Ch-ch-ch. Boom! Yeah, yeah, it just blows, yeah, blows up blows like up. that guy. That guy right there. That's that's you need that on a on a zombie killing team. Yeah. So he kind of yeah. like assimilates with the group, mm-hmm. and eventually, spoiler alert, sacrifices, sacrifices himself, himself yeah. for the group. And it kind of like, kind mm-hmm. of like I, I'm sacrificing myself because I'm I gotta sacrifice myself kind of right. way. Did you notice that? Well, I think he's like, I'll stay behind, and I'm like, why though? <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to. And I think I think that's literally the problem in every single Zack Snyder movie. I don't think it's. I think actually that's a common theme that we see in every Zack Snyder movie: that the plight of a hero, the need sure. to sacrifice and self-sacrifice, um, almost to the benai of some of his movies, to sure. where as it, like you said, it almost feels like a character sacrificing himself for for for, for, for sacrificing themselves. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about that in later um, in later Zack Snyder movies sure. too. But you know, I think I think that's also what's fascinating about his filmography too. Um, the pl- the plight of the hero what he has to endure in order to become a hero and how does that, you know, reflect on his, like on his or hers machismo, um, her, their place in their society and sure. their, you know, so. I, and, and how they can use their skills to further a cause or a group. Right, right, exactly. And then we even see that carrying over into something like 300, right, which is um, a movie about, you know, one dude, um, Leonidas, who is 
forced to leave his family, forced to leave his village, um, you know, to command this army the, to a seemingly impossible mission, and how how his sacrifice and his um, endurance and his bearing has to um, leads to um, this fight and how how they're able to, able to overcome. Sure. Um, so I you know I, I, again that's a common theme that we see in, in a lot Zach of Zack Snyder films. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, one thing I want to say about this movie as well is um it gives me the most realistic form and we've seen this in the walking dead too but it gives me the most realistic form of killing someone who you know is infected mm. that to me in this movie is done so well where it's like if, you, if you're someone really close to you a cousin a, a brother a friend is infected like they're bitten right so you know right. they're gonna turn and you know there's no cure yeah you gotta kill them, right? Yeah. They handle this so well with that, um, with the young girl and her dad. Oh, yeah. Because it, what you do is you take them in a room, you say your goodbyes, uh -huh. you say, "Hey, you know," you talk to them, and you and you wait for them to basically pass. Yeah. And then once they come back, you kill them. And I was like, that's handled so well. Yeah. Like that's the way to do it, and that's so like humane because unlike in other you know zombie films or other zombie movies, it's some sort of dramatic like they got to kill their parents or they got to yeah. kill their family. But this one is like, oh, you're infected. You know, it's been good knowing you. I love you. You know, you know, here's yeah. my will, whatever it is. Yeah. And then say, you know, goodbye and have someone shoot him or something. Yeah. Like RIP to my man Luda though, man. Uh, and, and Andrea, m racially motivated killing of Luda. No, I'm kidding. Um, but <laughs> that guy, uh, no, I, that's also their scenario, right? Like their baby becomes a, a zombie. That to me, that, that, scene, that scene is so, it takes me out of the movie. <laughs> it just takes me out of the movie. It's just like baby zombie. <laughs> it's like, no. like ah, you know, no. And then yeah. you hear a gunshot, and I'm like, come on. Yeah. That's whack. <laughs> but uh, that's a whole different conversation, too, having that um, couple be Russian and a black guy. Yeah, a yeah. A Russian girl and a, and a black dude. Yeah. And then having a. Um, having the baby and the idea of pregnancy or bringing a, a, a baby into this world. And that's, and you know, that's funny where the original film had that whole, like the original film actually kind of stopped and had a whole conversation about abortion, right? In the, the original uh, Down to the Dead. Sure. Um, and they kind of have to talk because the main character in that film is pregnant. And uh, like our hero, Peter, is like, you know, are you sure you don't want to abort it? You know, all this kind of stuff. And that's really, I mean, that's kind of like almost progressive talk for something that was coming out 1970s yeah something like yeah, so, yeah 78 so and you know again that's you know that's kind of the main difference and, between and I, and I know this is handled very very lightly in this movie but mm -hmm. there is a, there's an idea there's not necessarily a it's not telling you, but it's hinting at you mm -hmm. of the idea of an Adam and Eve, a, a, a repopulation of the planet with right. a young homie and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Right, I, right. There's there's the idea of like, oh, they're a couple. We got to keep them safe because they're going to repopulate the earth when the earth is all dead or whatever. Yeah. Because they they end up coupling up and they end up kind of fighting for each other and looking for each other. And then I, as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to represent like... The idea of like love coming back and in, mm -hmm. in, in the zombie world and, and the idea of like future uh, humanity being further down the line. Right. right. And they even have that whole moment where like the TV evangelist is talking on TV. Yeah. I think even that's the same actor from the original um down of the dead but of course like when when and watching in the, in the context of that it's like yeah like of course in the real world there would be some sort of tv evangelist who was like oh yeah same sex marriage is causing good uh, you know like yeah. all that stuff you know so and um, he says he says the line um he's like when there's no more dead to to when there's no more space in hell the dead will walk the earth or something right, like right, that. Right. i think that's the line he says which is so dumb but uh <laughs> but it's it's that's the tagline of the movie too, it is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, that's that's something that definitely plays a hand in this in this uh, movie for sure. Mm. Well, last thing on this movie for me, what do you think about the ending? Um, I mean, the to a lot of people, ending, the yeah, final final ending, the whole like found everyone footage, dies. Yeah. Oh, oh, that. Yeah. 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 I don't care, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, did the, you not feel cheated in any way? Like, well, we just follow this entire story for them to just die. Yeah, on yeah I dies. think I think the in ending, the most like. The anticlimactic way ever it was, it was the worst part it was the worst part of the movie definitely and yeah. um and especially for something that built up to where they're going for for so long and 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 building that like i said the commodity you know the weird tone that kind of helped you connect to these people sure um just kind of cheaping it out like that was kind of weird i didn't see i didn't i didn't really know what they're going for i didn't know if that was like a budget thing either like they just kind of ran out of money sure. or something or i 
I don't know because that wasn't the ending of the original <laughs> Dawn of the Dead either. So I just I don't I don't know. Like that was, and, and, that was a little puzzling. You could tell like the the film like ends. Yeah, it's almost like a post credit scene where we find out what happens. Because yeah. I rewatched it and I was like, oh, that was the ending. And then it has like ten seconds later, there's a post credit scene of like found footage. Yeah, and it was like everyone died, and I was like, mm, "That's weird. Why yeah. did we have to see that?" I don't yeah. know. It just took me out of the movie for sure. Um, any last word on Dawn of the Dead? No, I think it's a really cool zombie flick, and I, it's probably I think it's the highest some Ryan pe- Tomatoes uh, score for Zack Snyder. I was gonna say some people say this is Zack Snyder's best film. What, what, what do you say to that? Well, I don't know. It's so different than the rest of his. Like all of his films are so desaturated. Yeah, but this is like the exact opposite like everything is very colorful very saturated very overlit yeah and uh, you know again i think that's totally uh, uh the the exact opposite of what every every other Zack snyder movie is so absolutely yeah speaking yeah. of that i want to talk about um every time someone mentions Zack snyder and what he brings to a movie they always 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 go back to visuals yeah this guy is a visual master visuals 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 he's very much known for this he's his own personal crazy style of visuals and i want to talk about that a little bit because i feel like that's what most people talk about when they talk about Zack snyder as far as positive aspects of him because i also want to give a major shout out to someone who gets very little credit considering how much Zack snyder is mentioned Mm -hmm. larry fong his dp oh right right oh my god yeah. This guy is a visual master. Mm-hmm. This guy is, he, he's the one who shot 300, Watchmen, BVS, all these movies that are known for their crazy visual, uh, atmospheric feel of a movie that makes you feel like you're watching an actual graphic novel come to life. Right. Like a, like a Watchmen or a 300, because that's a graphic novel too. Right. It, Larry Fong is, is Zack Snyder's DP, so basically he works with Zack Snyder in the vast majority of his films. Not all of his films, but the majority of his films are mm-hmm. with... Larry Fong and their kind of partnership is kind of what makes the visual style of all their movies but to me Zack Snyder is still a visual master I'm not saying he isn't I'm just saying that partnership is what makes it good because Zack is still the guy in the freaking editing room yeah and he's still cutting it all together and he's still making sure that everything works Mm -hmm. but what do you think of this partnership and what do you think of the visual style of Zack Snyder well, it's tough. You know, it's tough with a director like Snyder, um, where so much of his movies are kind of built in the computer, mm. right? Like, a lot of very effects-heavy, mostly shot on green screen or mm-hmm. blue screen, or in the case of 300, actually shot on the red screen, which is weird. Um, but, yeah, there's it's a lot of what... Um, it's, it's difficult, you know, especially with something when it comes to uh, DPs and credits and all that stuff. Like, as do you specifically dp do you specifically give credit to a uh, director of photography or cinematographer um when so much of the movie is cgi when you have something like 300 where the whole like iconic falling off the cliff scene was uh really all green screen um but you know so but of course that's a whole different conversation but i i I personally feel yeah i i think if you sit down at a computer and and you visually compose an image then yeah you should get credit because it still is it's different because it's not in camera but it's still a visual representation of what you want to show right but what what i'm saying is you know a lot of times the dps aren't there for post-production right like a lot of times they just kind of shoot the movie sure move on and then they leave it to the task that's, a, that's another question and too stuff like that if so. i had to put money on it i would say he is but I don't know. Obviously, we right. can't, we don't we don't know. But yeah, of course we don't know. And of course, you know, you know, come bringing it back to Snyder. Um, you know, Snyder is of course in charge of all of those decisions. How sure. the film is going to look, how it's going to. Um, so and but you you do make a great point of having somebody like Larry Fong who is consistent and uh, working with Snyder and and shooting his films and designing the look that we see in all of it because. When you watch a Zack Snyder movie, you know it's a Zack Snyder movie right from the get-go. Yep. Um, you know, and I think a big part of that is the way it's lit, the way its colors are kind of muted, kind of toned down. Um, you know, and all of it to give the effect of a sense of realism, right? Um, almost the effect that some shots almost look like monochromatic because it's like one kind of color that they're going for, but they want you to feel... Uh, they want you to feel like this is a realistic portrayal of how this film, you know, 
make it you know how how real it is how real these stories are how real these characters are um so kind of dissolve a little bit of the suspension of disbelief sure so i think that's important when it comes to a relationship between a director and dp to establish that kind of look and style sure so, sure speaking of oh, go i'm ahead. sorry just one more thing but if i'm not mistaken justice league is a different dp I right think it is. yeah so that and you can clearly see in the trailers for the movie it's a very different <laughs> look, yeah very don't get me started <laughs> again i'm i'm Come on now. Never mind. I, I have my own <laughs> thoughts. I, I understand that tragedy is what prompted this, but I do feel like I feel like Warner Brothers is so concerned with competing with the MCU that they don't realize that what Snyder was developing could have been something that worked, considering Wonder Woman worked, and that's all Snyder. He's got writing credits on that. He's the one yeah. who casted Wonder Woman. The slow motion. He's uh, the one who did the slow motion. <laughs> like that's Snyder. Like uh, Patty Jenkins deserves the credit, absolutely. But that came from Snyder's brain, and yeah. I feel like uh, trying to be like, well, let's let's do Snyder, but Joss Whedon at the same time, and it's like, no, let's not, let's not do it. I mean, obviously, I haven't seen the movie yet, but yeah, yeah. I just feel like when it comes to a visionary director like a Whedon and a Snyder, mashing them together probably won't work for me. But that's a whole different conversation. Right. Well, I, I also I also want to say too, like I know there's a lot of people um, when this whole thing was announced with Whedon and, and, and Snyder and all that, you know, I, I think, I think the most important thing is though, that the tragedy is first. first Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, and that's not, I'm not excusing that. In yeah, any way. no, of course. But Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just saying for, you know, maybe some of the guys who wants to come in the comment sections for this or whatever, I, I don't care, but like, don't, you know, family is, you know, first and foremost, you sure. know what I mean? And you ain't got to insult the guy, you know, he's going through a hard time, of course. Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it's an important, it's an important thing, you know, kind of a, as a nerd community, we should be responsible for um, being accountable. Yeah, my, stuff, my, but. my, my thoughts are towards Warner Brothers. Not right, right, of course. Snyder. Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's actually yeah. the opposite. It, it, yeah. I'm saying that they, but before the they, movie even started rolling cameras, they had these, uh, you know, kind of presets for Snyder to make the this the stuff lighter. That's what I'm, I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they kind of t- again, I'm, this is me spitting. I'm just spitting what I feel, but I feel like they're taking advantage of a tragic situation with Snyder, where they're like, "Oh, he's off now. Okay, now let's try and recolor and redo this one." When in fact, it probably wasn't. They probably weren't going to be that extensive changes, but now they're taking advantage of the fact that Snyder is off with a tragic situation and now they're just trying to redraw and all that. And I feel like that's so disgusting of, of Warner brothers to do that. And obviously this is my personal opinion and it's not based on anything. It's just based on my opinions, but I'm saying that I wish that this wasn't such a, a market based on, you know, competition that instead of creating something good and original and fun, they create, a, 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 a copycat version of the MCU that I, it's not going to work. Right. I mean, we could we could talk. We were probably going to talk about Batman v Superman we are. and Man of Steel a little later. So <laughs> yeah. Um. You know, I have my thoughts on those, but I do think it was. I think going into is an interesting idea of having um, a Marvel Cinematic Universe that's a little lighter, whereas a DC universe that is a little darker have a little more serious. I mean, we're going to talk. We're, we're going to talk. Do you about feel it, like so. that? That's the way it should have been. To me, I, I like the direction that they're going, even though I, I didn't like the movies. Like, I didn't. I agree. Yeah. I, I'm 100%. I mean, I, that's my thing, too. It's like, I am 100% agree. Everyone's like, they should make it lighter. So people. No, they shouldn't. They should just keep doing what they're doing and, and keep I, trying. I am very afraid that as we continue to go down the line, there's only going to be like light and funny comic book movies, and then we're going to go back to the Joe Schumacher Batman days. You know, I don't uh, know about that, but I do feel I like think- we're. we're I, I feel like. Um, having the dc movies be a little heavier and being a little darker right and having the mcu movies be a little lighter a little funnier perfect yeah. that would have worked perfectly i um, think they just yeah. be like you said just because some movies didn't work doesn't mean the tone is it it was never the tone that was the issue that was yes. never the issue for me and we're gonna i'm gonna we are gonna talk we're gonna talk about it before yeah. we do let's jump to 300, 300 because we're talking yeah. about visuals um 300 is known for its visuals, but like yeah. you said, it was mainly all green screen, right? Yeah. But uh, 300 is a very interesting movie. I just rewatched this one last night. It's extremely over the top, extremely violent, extremely jarring, right? Because it, it, it takes you into Greek and Sparta and Persia and all this stuff that's real, mm-hmm. and then it makes it, 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 this is obviously based on the novel, the yeah, graphic Frank novel, Frank Miller, yeah. which he does. I'm not giving credit to Snyder for this, but I'm saying that it, it takes those real actual events and real stories and makes it into this ridiculous, crazy 
fantasy right. of of what it was that back then with creatures, with monsters, with uh, just bizarre images that that makes it feel it it, it just makes it feel different than a right. period piece right. or a sword and sandals movie. This isn't that. It's not that. It's more of a comic book movie than it is a sword and sandals movie. But what are your general opinions on this movie? No, I like this movie a lot, man. This is was... what made Zach the the guy we know today. Oh this yeah, this is what made yeah. him famous. And you know, it's his first comic book adaptation out of many that we'll, he gets into, and it's Frank Miller. And I remember reading a story where um, when he went in to make this. This movie make the pitch for this movie he actually took the graphic novel of frank frank miller and kind of animated it mm-hmm. and um and he actually growing up he he wanted to do a career in animation um until he saw the first star wars um and the first uh, star wars movie uh, a new hope convinced him to go into filmmaking just in general um but you know having something you know taking the graphic novel animating it to kind of convince a studio like hey this is something that could be a great visual mass a good blockbuster and um and you know put some backing behind and it and it clearly worked and bringing that distinct visual style of the comic book to the live action format worked really well um of course the film has some problems you know the, sometimes the pacing gets a little wonky sure um but like as an overall action movie i mean it's really fun and kind of one of the most influential action movies i'll probably say in the last 20 years um i would agree yeah the style that kind of went implemented from this movie uh, is almost unescapable. Um, I feel like this and Jason Bourne are kind of the two different, two main templates that we see in action movies now where we see the time remapping, right? Like where it'll just speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Um, we see the way they use like the, the snap zooms, like it'll just zoom in super fast and then back in and back out. A lot of the tropes that we see in modern action movies visually at least come from 300 um and i think it just deserves props on that alone as being one of the timeless one of the first to do that so yeah and i mean obviously the action in this movie is crazy the fight choreography to me is what stands out the most yeah um obviously because to me that's what what stands out in the movie because the way he captures fight choreography is beautiful yeah it's so good obviously my favorites are when King Leonidas goes uh, one on twenty, when mm. he fights those guys, right, and he starts right, first, right. He, he does a spear, spear, throws a spear, pulls out the uh, the shield, shield, uh. shield, shield, kills like five dudes with the shield, right. then sword, then sword, 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 and kills like that. To me, is really good. But another one for me that doesn't get enough credit is Michael Fassbender's and his mm. and homeboy um, son. I, I don't know his name in the movie, yeah. but the son of the captain. Mm-hmm. Um, their dual battle. They're when they go back to back mm-hmm. and they're taking out dudes and they they literally do a circle. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. They go back to back, kill, 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 circle, 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 back to back. Mm-hmm. It's so freaking well done, and it's all in camera, which yeah. is shocking, and it's all the actors doing it it's michael fassbender doing yeah. it because i was really paying attention to like the cg stitch face that we see a lot mm-hmm. like in kingsman right where right. they st- cg stitch face a person on there <laughs> but this was like that you could tell like that's that's michael without a mask uh-huh. and this i gotta give a shout out obviously to michael fassbender in yeah. this movie he is so happy to be in this movie dude yeah, this is a breakout, breakout this role. was his breakout role and yeah. this he you could tell he's so like freaking excited to be in this movie like obviously his character is very over the top and excited but the actor himself the way he commits to every action scene and he pulls it off so well and the way he just does his crazy character because he's the guy who says you know we'll fight in the shade and he's the guy who has like a lot of funny lines because some of the lines in this movie dude i think that's the standout of this movie as well the action and the lines because yeah, the lines in this yeah. movie are funny there are They're some so all-time classics all-time classics <laughs> my what um he's like oh our arrows will blot out the sun and it's like yeah. then we will fight in the shade that's one <laughs> uh, my other favorite my favorite one is when the persian guy with the whip Mm-hmm. he cuts off his arm yeah he says ah my arm and then michael fassbender looks down on him and he's like it's not yours anymore and i'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously and you know this ten- is sparta of course this is sparta yeah. tonight we dine in hell this yeah. movie is an instant classic dude. Yeah. it became an instant classic with lines that we all remember yeah and lines that we um 
that we will never forget because of this freaking movie you know yeah. uh, earth and water or the sparta kick this is sparta and all yeah. that stuff is like really comes from here yeah and and it and it really did make Zack snyder from a mid-range director making 40 million dollar movies to like yeah. blockbuster A-list, yeah yeah and and i think again i think that's part of his influence in, in the industry right people are referencing you know they kind of want this style they want to see this style in their movies from now on and even in tv shows um but i think more significantly going back to the point of you talking about fassbender doing all of the stunts and all of the fighting scenes like that's a staple of Zack snyder to have his actors train for months and months and months yeah. to do uh, all their own action and you really see it in, in the film like you get a real look at you know this is really fassbender or we'll see in sucker punch this is really like vanessa hudgings or like all of these different people um you know having a real training background um, allows you to do a lot of stuff in camera. It's allows you to do a lot of long takes. And, you know, of course, he adjusts maybe a lot of those takes in post-production. Um, but you see, like, a lot of these really, really cool and fascinating moves and and uh, and, and ways that, you, you know... And I think that's also a bigger theme in, in Zack Snyder movies is, like, the theme of machismo, masculinity. Um, We're going to talk about that. Yeah, sure. so... And, and, and again, I think that's really... Uh, and I, I think 300 capitalizes off of having It, it capitalizes movies. that times 20. Yeah, It's yeah. crazy. But well, Gerard, Gerard Butler... Uh, Gerard Butler, obviously. And, yeah. and, and the, the thing to me that makes this movie work the most is to have a script like this mm -hmm. one and then the kind of action choreography that you're going to get from this having that two combination you can see that in any movie mm -hmm. but what makes it different to me is having the actors who are so freaking committed obviously mm -hmm. with their bodies because they're working out like 20 million times a day or whatever mm -hmm. but like they're so freaking committed to the point that you will have someone like a Michael Fassbender becoming a Spartan in the, yeah. in the sense of how much training and Gerard, Gerard Butler becoming that character physically is what makes it work so well. That's what makes the action scenes work is knowing that that is really mm -hmm. King Leonidas or that is really Michael Fassbender. That right. to me is what the, the formula that makes this movie work so well. Mm hmm yeah for yeah. sure um we're gonna jump into that but before we do i, I really want to jump into watchmen oh yes um, because watchmen i want to use watchmen as our gateway into a talk on a little bit of the political atmosphere around Zack snyder because for some reason he has become a very political director mm -hmm. and whether that be certain political people putting that perspective on Zack or whether that be Zack showing it in his movies is still like, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I'm not sure. But I want to hear your perspective specifically with this movie um, as far as the political atmosphere and as far as politically what Zack was trying to say. And also your general thoughts on this movie because I know you saw this one in theaters, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, I think, well, actually, you know, this is the first episode we ever did where I've seen, like, all of his movies in theaters. Yeah. Um, so this one, yeah, I remember watching this one. I was I was probably young, too young to be watching it, but um, I remember initially watching this film. Um, it is kind of a transcendent superhero movie. Um, this is really ahead of its time, honestly. I think it's kind of a masterpiece to me um, because it, it, it really is a superhero movie about the tropes of the superheroes and the, the conventions of superheroes, but um, how those can have some real downfalls and repercussions and how in a realistic world, this is how this would happen. Um, you know, in, in a world where we, and in a world where the United States goes off to war with Vietnam, but we have a Dr. Manhattan on our side, how that would prompt eight reelections of a uh, of a uh, of a Nixon, or how you know all all of these different aspects of of how this movie works is really fascinating. It has an interesting comedy com commentary on not just how superheroes work within their own facet, but how the rest of the world kind of reacts to um, idols and figures and, um, you know, models of, uh, of our behavior. And um, I think that's most apparent in the character of the comedian, who is somebody who uh, loves violence, who loves attacking people, who breaks up riots, shooting rubber bullets into the crowd and punching people. And to him, that's the American way. That's what he sees America as. Whereas you have something like Night, somebody like Night Owl, who's kind of just more of a straight up patriarch who wants to see the 
people be better and the world be better, um, but not necessarily um, attribute uh, in, anything anything to that. And, you know, kind of feels repressed to the somebody like the comedian who is so upright and, and aggressive. So what's interesting about this movie, too, and, and I kind of I kind of want to follow the 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 way this movie does it is that they break down each character one by one mm -hmm. you notice that right like right. they first to show you who's this person who's that person then it cuts to that person then it cuts to that person and each person gets their own like backstory kind of moment like whether intro, it's rorschach yeah. um the uh, comedian, dr manhattan the comedian, the comedian with the opening sequence is the comedian like with the opening sequence even though it's not his backstory but you you know immediately what that guy is and what he's what he's capable of doing let's talk about the comedian because i i think the comedian you're right he is one of the most interesting ones because he's the most offensive character i've seen on screen one oh, of the yeah. most offensive the fact that he shoots a pregnant woman yeah the fact that yeah. he loves burning people the fact that he rapes people yeah. the fact that he the, the, he loves murdering I, I one of my favorite lines in the movie is when um night owl was talking to ozzy mandias mm -hmm. and he's like you know the comedian died or well blah 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 and he's like the comedian's a sociu sociopath he's crazy yeah and, and and he's like and then he says one of my favorite lines too because he says he's practically a nazi Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said that, I was like, huh, he's practically a Nazi. The fact that this guy fights for Nixon and is like, a, is, right. he's Nixon's personal assassin. Like right. Nixon, Nixon had his personal like bodyguard, personal like uh, attack dog. Mm -hmm. That was the comedian. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Ozymandias called him a Nazi, I was like, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that he's so evil and so disgusting that even if he is American, he's still Nazi, and he's yeah. still that dark, you know, racist, yeah. disgusting human being. He, he encompasses everything wrong with the America and the United States. Sure, and like everything that we kind of sweep under the rug or mm -hmm. kind of push aside in our heroes, mm -hmm. um, he kind of represents all of that. Um, and a lot of times when we see our heroes now, we see, you know, unfortunately, people like Bill Cosby, who is like a major rapist. Mm -hmm. um, we see. Uh, a lot of our heroes now, at least in 2017, we're seeing a lot of that becoming exposed. Um, but, you know, back then, uh, you know, back in the days of this is set in like the 70s or just back in any other time in history, we just know like our leaders were just complete assholes, dicks, racists. You know, Walt Disney was an anti-Semite. Anti so like a lot of different, a lot of different aspects that we just kind of brush under the rug. Sure. Um, the comedian represents a lot of that. Um, so... And him, you know, when he dies, he kind of has like this tragic thing that kind of sparks and ignites the film. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways is, you know, kind of representing of what uh, is also wrong with society. Right. Like, sure. um, you know, we're only ready to talk about how good or bad somebody was, you know, post death. And, and now that triggering of events leads to um, an ultimate um, catastrophic you know, event. So. That's another thing, too. You, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, his, his funeral. Uh -huh. I, was, I was really, really paying attention to that because I, I was paying attention to the fact that they honor him as like a U.S. hero. Exactly. A soldier. Like a soldier. Mm -hmm. like, like a guy, like a Marine, a veteran, something you give honor to, right? Because normally that's what you should do. You give honor to veterans. But this guy, it, it, it's, it felt different, right? Watching mm -hmm. that scene because you're like, he's a veteran, but he's also not a veteran. <laughs> yeah. He's also a crazy killer and kind of terrible human being. So should he be honored that way because of the actions he took? Or should he be honored by the man of his own character? Mm -hmm. And if he was, would he really have that, ex that exuberance of a funeral, right? Right. Because it, it's one of those things where you honor the man that he was not the man that he became mm -hmm. i guess you could say yeah. but even then it's like i don't know it's one of those things where where is the line of good and evil does it become it, it becomes what country you're a part of right because if you're american then it's good and if you're not american then it's bad right right right, right. Um, um that to me was mainly the part of the comedian um and obviously jeffrey d morgan as well oh so good i yeah. mean man that's that I love was jeffrey like his morgan. breakout that's his breakout performance too really uh, i know him from supernatural he oh was supernatural sam, oh okay yeah, 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 yeah he's yeah, sam yeah. and dean's dad uh let's talk about rorschach oh yeah what do you think about rorschach well i think he's kind of the epitome of like the noir character like the batman aspect of like the investigator he's the a question the question the question perfect perfect yeah. perfect reference he really is like yeah he was based that's what alan moore based yeah. his character off yeah. of yeah um you know and i think exactly like he's he's a he's a brilliant detective who uh you know he has the ventriloquist mask mm -hmm. so um he wants the rorschach test mask right rorschach test there we go and you know and in that you're you're kind of you know 
in his wearing that, you're wondering, you know, what's your interpretation of him? You sure. know, um, how do you see this guy? Is he sure. good? Is he bad? You know, there's no more. Th- there's a lot of moral ambiguity when it comes to to Warshak. Um, is him killing people and slaughtering people the right thing? Um, is him only hunting down criminals bad? Or what about that scene when he's taking out the police? Is that um, a, the sign of a hero? You know, we don't know. That's that's the big question that he poses. I think that's really what's fascinating about this film is that you can have a character like Rorschach who wants to do the right thing, who wants to see humanity thrive and wants people to be, you know, you know, people live life as transparently and as honestly as possible. Um, but in that coming, you know, is that coming in the way of um, actual peace, actual, you know, that's the question that we're posed with at the end. And we don't get a clear answer to that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's a great character though. Um, homeboy plays him, um, I forget his name. Dude, same. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. And he's he's great in everything. The guy who plays him, he is great in every single performance he's in. But um, Jackie, Jackie O'Haley. There Jackie O'Haley, yeah. Um, great. And, you know, he kind of brings that level of intensity that's necessary for a character like this, right? Uh, you know, like a lot of his actions are morally ambiguous, but to him is very black and white. You know, he's very one-sided of what he feels. And having having a character who, who presents that duality. And even even in that scene in the prison where he uh, is literally, you know, barking at people, taking charge, cutting people's hands off. The, the yeah. best line in the entire movie. It's like, I don't think you guys understand. I'm not locked in here with you. You're, You're locked, locked in, in here, here with me. me. Yeah. I was like, shit. Yeah. Yeah. This guy is crazy. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So, so it's 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 interesting with a character like that because you're asking a lot of questions about him. You're open to a lot of interpretations about him. Sure. But he believes in a very set strict rule. So what what are your thoughts on like Rorschach? Yeah, man. See, Rorschach to me is like he's technically you could say he's the only good guy in this movie. Think about it. the The entire movie is based on Doctor Manhattan. And Ozymandias convincing everyone that he's the one who created all the atomic bonds, bombs that blew up all the major cities like New York, Beijing, and all these cities, right. Moscow. Um, and Rorschach's the only one who says the truth is the only thing that the people need to hear. Mm-hmm. Never compromise, not even in the face of Armageddon. That's the big line he says right, at the end right, of the movie. Right. And he's the only one. Th- technically, you could say... By association, Night Owl, Silk Spectre, Doctor Manhattan are all evil, right? Because they, they went along, along with, with the it. plan of yeah. Ozymandias. Freaking Rorschach was the only one who said, "Screw you guys! You guys are gonna have to kill me because I'm gonna be good till the end." And I right. love that. That's that's why he's probably my favorite character. I love Ozymandias too. I think he's great. Yeah. But but Ozymandias to me is just an embodiation, uh, an embodiment of Lex Luthor. Mm-hmm. He's he's basically Lex. He's he's a weird combination of Lex and Batman. Yeah, and um, Iron Man too. And Iron Man. That's yeah. a good point. But Rorschach to me is the only good guy in the story. Technically, mm-hmm. he really is. I mean, obviously he kills people, but then again, you could make another argument for that. But to me, it's like that final scene where he blows up Rorschach and that Night Owl screaming right. and all that, oh, that is so, so good. Yeah. It's so good because you realize that, crap, this is a story where the bad guy won. Yeah. Is, 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 is peace based on a lie still peace? You know? Right, right, right. I don't and know. Is it, it, if it, 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 to kill millions to save billions is another line that Ozzy Mandias has. Let's talk about Ozzy Mandias because to me, I think I think that actor is great. Is Mac, Matthew Good? I think is his yeah, name. Yeah, Matthew Good. Yeah, I love Ozzy Mandias. Oh, I think yeah. he's great because I feel like that's such a it's a villain we've seen so many times. Lex had the exact same plan. Ra's al Ghul had the exact same plan in Batman Begins. It was it's we've seen it before, but the fact that he executes it. Mm-hmm. does it doesn't let anyone stop him and the fact that he's the world's smartest man and he almost out he kind of literally outsmarts a god but yeah. with dr manhattan exactly where dr manhattan is like you might as well be the smartest ant or might i think he says termite yeah and it's like well actually i did outsmart you because guess what and he turns on the tv yeah and he shows him that i was secret right weapon. Yeah, yeah that's my secret weapon that i was right that this is really the way to do it don't place the blame on any of the countries place it on an outside source where all the rage and all the anger can be focused on that which mm-hmm. is dr manhattan which is a, a you know a, a creature of power a, a god basically mm-hmm. if, if the if the americans and the russians can focus on that then there will be peace 
because uh, the world doesn't have a threat within the world. The world has a threat outside of the world, mm -hmm. right? Right. So Ozymandias to me was like, shoot, this is a story where the bad guy kind of wins. Yeah. Does the end justify the means? That's this is all literally out of the Lex Luthor handbook because I, I, Lex is my favorite villain like ever. It's Lex and Magneto are my two favorite villains. So seeing this, I was like, oh, that's Lex. That's mm -hmm. literally what Lex has been saying for years. But Superman's like, no, you can't do that because that's still killing people. Mm -hmm. What do you say? <laughs> right. No, I mean, there's there's a point there's a point to his argument. I mean, this is a character who is a man who has a terrible like God 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 complex he like does he wants, which is what lex has dude <laughs> right right but yeah right. go ahead no and then he even dresses himself and you know at least in the comic book he dresses himself in the egyptian garb mm -hmm. to kind of represent like his you know kind of kind of what he's inspired by of course in the movie they do the whole parody of the batman and robin uh, <laughs> bat nipples oh yeah, yeah, yeah they do so, um, but he does have the the, the little but he has the egyptian stuff lines. yeah and he does he does that and um so i think that's really you know it, Again, I think that's what he's he he wants to make the decision uh, that he believes mankind cannot make. Mm -hmm. um, so in um, destroying New York and like all these different cities, um, you know, of course, it's going to unite people because they have one common enemy, which would be Dr. Manhattan, um, who is a figure that. Uh, you know, they kind of even say in the movie is, you know, God on earth uh, to a lot of people uh, because the, the way he's able to change matter and, and do all this stuff, you know, he, he's. He's, basically yeah he's a god he's a god sure. yeah so i'm like with 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 that when he you know so having somebody who you know the people at the same time admire and fear so when that fear is escalated to the point of oh you could justify it by saying that dr manhattan just had like a temper tantrum and just like you know destroyed half of the world and then he can just teleport to another galaxy and it's like boom it's done yeah he yeah. doesn't have to worry about his own safety or whatever right right exactly so then when when something like that happens um of course um, of course, the the world is going to unite. And of course, anim, um, um, Ozymandias becomes is, turns out to be right. That's what happens. And you know, does the end justify the means? I say no. That's kind of a. I agree. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's very that's good guy very, to the end. <laughs> right, right. It's very much a bit, you know, Team I, Rorschach. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's a, I mean, it's a bad he's a bad guy. He's you still know? killing a lot of people. That's a yeah. lot of dead people, man. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of dead people. I'm yeah. good. I don't need to have that on my hands. But uh, but yeah, I think that's handled so well throughout the movie for sure. And obviously, he compares himself to Ramesses the um, second, mm -hmm. which is also based on that poem which we see in a bunch of other movies but i freaking adore which is uh look upon my work see mighty and despair oh right 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 where i am ozymandias yeah, king of kings yeah um but basically that's kind of what he embodies in that whole movie um before we move on let's real quick let's talk about the political atmosphere in this movie because obviously this movie is extremely political yeah um what do you feel like this movie is trying to say politically especially to let's tie this into the opening credits as well oh yeah those opening credits with uh, bob dylan uh, right. the times, times are, are changing. changing yeah um that has a lot to say in just an opening credit scene again credit one to zach best, snyder oh, but one of the best, one of the opening, best credit. opening credits ever right yeah. And, yeah. and that's uh, zach snyder um what do you think of those opening credits and what do you think about because that to me that opening credits is is those four minutes are as politically charged as the entire film yeah and i think that's what was so efficient about it he kind of took um the first half of or at least the good half of watchmen and condensed it into that four minute um you know se sequence and you get you get those uh it has it reflects a lot of iconic moments that we see in normal like u.s history and photography yes um, i mean obviously J jfk that one's a little gnarly right. i can't like that was a little tiny bit a tiny bit offensive but i'm not gonna say too soon but right. but it still was like seeing the comedian kill jfk i was like, right oh. well that's what that's what that's what it's saying i mean you're kind of talking about it being nixon's uh you know the comedian being kind of nixon's uh bulldog like yeah. his, you know is that i mean that that really is and again it's coming from a very like you said political place yeah um you know the the movement towards um liberation the hip the hippie movement is the hip, in there yeah the, yeah the two the two, the two women lesbian kissing, girls yeah. being murdered brutally yeah um, oh but even even the whole like the the whole iconic photo of after the war is over yeah and instead of it being the soldier it's, it's uh one of the one of the chicks. women yeah. yeah um so Again, I think that's what's really, uh, you know, if we 
again, that's kind of the twist on society that sure. we kind of see if there were superheroes. Um, this is kind of how they would they would be acting. And, right? and one of the ones I like too is like if there were superheroes, they'd probably be locked up in an insane asylum because they're crazy yeah. for dressing up as superheroes and right. trying to beat up people as vigilantes. And right. we see that in the opening credit too with the guy being pulled away and he's like biting the one of the insane asylum guys and uh-huh. he's like biting his ear and shit and he's right. like being pulled into the into the insane bus i don't know what you call it but you know the typical white kind yeah, of yeah, ambulance yeah. looking bus and they're all orderlies in yeah. this asylum but that's essentially what would happen in real life right, right. they would be taken to insane asylums and stuff because they're right. kind of crazy and so. they, they established the history of the old watchmen and how they kind of conducted business sure. and how the new generation of watchmen is a different team uh you know how but you could kind of see like the older generation reflected more of a more traditional sense of a superhero team sure and that opening credits right they are um just a set of people who are trying to do the right thing essentially but as the new generation starts to come in uh there's a lot more distrust and a lot more um, moral ambiguity when mm-hmm. it comes to that like um, like the times are changing right exactly yeah um, i do want to mention one thing about Watchmen, though sure. and i think this is a criticism that a lot of people have about this movie sure. in terms of adapting the source material is this focus on violence, right? The violence yes. in this movie I was is... going to bring that up, but you brought it up for me. There yeah. I mean, I think what this... With this I think that's kind of what hinders the movie for me a I little agree. bit. I agree. I 100% agree. And I think that's really where a lot of people claim that Snyder misinterpreted the material. I would also say that as well. Like, uh, a lot of what Watchmen was was nonviolence. It was a nonviolent comic book. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about how our sensationalization of violence in superhero comics and, and of, of superhero media in general is what is leading us to a desensitization of um, real life violence and of of what an actual actual consequences would be um, in a, in uh, the sake of violence, especially in the ending. So. Absolutely, 100% agree with you because yeah. I do feel like that is the one thing that really took me out of the movie. Besides the, we won't talk about the giant spaceship sex scene. That also uh, took me out of the movie. Ah, uh, man, I love uh, it. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. <laughs> that took me out of the movie way out. It's like, what is going on? This is eight minutes when, of when hallelujah. The, when the fire. Uh, <laughs> I hated that. I was like, this is so ridiculous. But I also thought that the violence was ridiculous. Yeah. Was so over the top, so overt, so in your face, so offensive. Obviously, Obviously, sure, he wanted to be offensive, but I, I feel like it didn't work. Like when we're meeting Dr. Manhattan and he's going to the TV interview, we have a fight scene with Night Owl and Silk Spectre. Yeah. They're just straight up murdering people, yeah, like breaking, breaking their bones, bones yeah. and like shooting. Like they're getting shot at and they're like, ro- their throats are being ripped. And I'm like, what's the point of this? I don't yeah. I, To show they're good fighters, you can show that in a different way. But I just didn't like that. I didn't like the scene of like, you're like, your hands are tied to the handlebars. Guess we're going to do a gore fest. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, is this a gore fest now? Like, that really took me out of the movie. I, I 100% agree with you that that is what hinders the movie overall there's, for me. There's no restraint. There's and no I, restraint. And I feel like, what is that? What would you say that is? Is that Zack Snyder trying to appeal to his like violent loving fans? I think I, I think that's exactly what. Yeah? I think Zack Snyder. They know me for 300 and violence. Maybe I should make this a little more violent. Well, I think just in general, I think with Snyder, his assumption is that audiences want to go to the movies to see violence. Sure. Wants to go to the movies to see action. And... Uh, you know and you know that's where this stands out like there are scenes in this book in this movie um like the whole prison escape sequence where where um silk specter and night owl uh, break rorschach out um in the in the the book that's only like a one page scene and the movie is is five minutes long of non-stop punching people and kicking people and 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 so i think that's where the problem lies is like the original graphic novel was all about preaching nonviolence, uh preaching how violence uh, you know the 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 end goal of violence is you know ultimately what what unites us but sure. in hiding the violence throughout the book you you don't see all of like the graphic explosions you don't see like they they they, they do take scenes out of the book where like you know manhattan like explodes people or um was, was that this was that the sequence when when he uh exploded that one dude and then like his blood went like flowing everywhere in that room or whatever yeah like 
you know, it, it, it wasn't like that in the, in the graphic novel. Um, and I think if you cut a lot of that stuff out, it'll make the movie so much better. So much better. So much cleaner. Yeah. Um, more concise. Because, again, like you said, the whole thing where they're leaving the restaurant and have to, you know, beat the dudes up. I could, I could see it if you do that but without the slow motion without all the bloody violence yes um, it makes a lot more sense and it makes it makes it it makes a lot more sense it, it feels like it, i'm not saying i'm cool i love violence like we we yeah. love tarantino tarantino is one of the most vi- like violence is cool i'm cool with it that's not what i'm saying that's not what we're saying what mm-hmm. we're saying is that the vi- there's a tone that the movie's going in and you feel it and you're in it you're in the tone of the movie and then all of a sudden there's like a head explodes and an eyeball pops out at you and you're you're taken out of it with the over the top <laughs> violence because it feels cartoonish almost yeah. it feels like what well, looney it, tunes cartoon with like look there goes his brain and his brain plops out and i'm like well, what what was the point of that it takes you out of the movie well i do think that to some extent they are making fun of it where sure. they have like those little like old batman sound effects when they hit sure, they kick people. sure um but they to another extent they're taking it so seriously that it's like the, it's the tone mesh it yeah. meshes and it doesn't really me- mesh with the tone i think if they would have saved all of the violence for the end scene with warshack and with the whole explosion of new york yeah. it would have been a lot more powerful would have hit a lot harder and it really would have encompassed a lot of what that book was going for um and i think that's kind of the problem with Zack snyder is that he is so trying to appeal to like a mass audience that a lot of what the meaning that is going is trying to be conveyed um doesn't come through all the way so 100 percent agree i can't believe we agree on that because i was watching it and i was thinking the exact same thing you were thinking i was like what was the point of making it that violent well like it didn't make sense to me as far as like what he was saying throughout the movie and what the violence was saying like it just felt odd to me it, i don't know it really took me out um any final words on Watchmen before we move on no i just think this is actually one of the best superhero movies ever made sure. um i think this is Zack snyder's magnum opus this is the best he's you ever you think this is the best movie he made yeah and um the violence if they toned down the violence this would have been a perfect movie yeah um especially adapting that graphic novel which is something that has been considered un- uh, unadaptable for many mm-hmm. many years mm-hmm. and i think he did a really good job at it mm-hmm. um but um yeah unfortunately it gets weighed down by and i don't know if that was him i don't know if that was the studio saying we need to put more action in here sure uh, maybe we you know they need to justify their r rating a little bit um but to me if you watch something like the dark knight or something where there's barely any blood um yeah. and it still works just as good with the action scene so yeah for um, me for me it wasn't the blood as much as the the oddness of the blood mm-hmm. like it didn't come like it wasn't just like it was like a jawbone breaks and the blood splatters in the camera and it splatters on a girl and I'm like why like that that's the the thing that really got mm. me but I but I agree with you another thing to me for this movie is uh, obviously we talked about the opening credits but the, the visuals are oh yeah incredible Gorgeous. another another credit to Snyder and Larry Fong mm. um, let's move on to Zack Snyder's real greatest movie ever the legend. Of the owls. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not yeah. called the Legend of the Owls. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> I actually, I actually remember seeing this movie. It came out the same. I don't know if it came out the same weekend, but it came out around the same time that the Social Network came out. So I remember Legend watching of the Guardians, the Owls of Galul. Galul. The Owls Galul. of the whatever. Galul. I don't care. Yeah. this is a dumb movie. Um, I remember watch. Like I said, I watched this the opening the same weekend the Social Network came out. Sure. Um, there's like the double header of, of that. And I just remember not liking this movie, man. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I it's, think it's all right. I it's, think it's, it's decent. It, it's but fine. Man. Yeah. It, it works fine. It, it just. Gorgeous movie. Yeah. I mean, that's, Gorgeous. again, Snyder. Um, yeah. It just didn't feel like it fitted in Zack Snyder's film book. Yeah. But. Even when people talk about Zack Snyder movies now, it's often left out. But I do think it, it does get props for the animation style that they're going for. Something completely unseen. I think it should have gotten an, an oscar nomination honestly for some like visual effects or um some sort of technical category because it is stunning and i know they brought in like roger deakins to help out with the lighting and the actual look of how you know how to how to make a, an animated film look sure um you know look realistic and it, it did that really well um but to me the story is just kind of eh, you know yeah. it's based on a book uh popular kids book yeah, um, I'm not sure if it's like the same name or whatever, but they were hoping for some real franchise potential here. Um, That's a bummer. Yeah. In that case, let's move on to Man of Steel. <laughs> well, we have Sucker Punch, right? Sucker Punch. Oh my gosh, Sucker Punch. Let's, let's get. That let's one. let's touch. <laughs> let's touch on Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch. Vanessa Hudgens. Yeah. Um, um, Oscar Isaac. Yeah. Pre, Emily, Emily pre, Brown. 
pre uh, Oscar Isaac hype. Yeah. This is Oscar Isaac when he's just a little Mexican dude. Right. And, right. and no one really knows who he is. Right. Um, yeah. What do you think about the greatest movie ever called Sucker Punch? It- <laughs> Yeah, this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, man. I, I can't give this movie... It's it's just a weird movie. It just feels like it doesn't... The, the dialogue is pretty rough in this movie. I feel like the dialogue... It's, everything's rough. Out. I, know, I remember watching... True. I remember watching... The editing's pretty rough, too. I, I tried to go back and rewatch all of Snyder's sure. films. I did. And I... This was one that I, I saw half, half of it. I couldn't get through 10 minutes, man. I couldn't get through 10 minutes. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Yeah. That whole opening thing with uh her trying to shoot the the dude but he shoots the light bulb and it kills his sister oh i don't know i was like what is this this is four minutes this is a one minute scene slow down to four like like one fourth speed <laughs> just to i don't know man i can i can get i can get it um i can get into it this and is what a lot of people say when they say that Zack snyder isn't as good as you might think he is they, they yeah. point to sucker punch they're like what about sucker punch and it's like well, I don't know. Well, that was he. He was he was sleeping, man. He was yeah. he was drunk. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of the definition of style over substance, too, right? Because you don't, you literally don't have any idea what's happening in story. But you see the trailers for that, and you're like, dang, yeah, that, that's an anime come to life. I'm yeah. down. And they have some really, they have some really cool ideas for action scenes, sure, like sure. the the whole mecha, like the that's the robot all that's war so stuff. animated. Yeah, like I can't tell you how anime that is. That is the most like anime with like a supercharged girl like that's yeah. so freaking anime yeah uh but this the execution of it just didn't work for me mm-hmm. especially being so dull and like so it kind of talked about monochromatic you talk I, you that movie's damn near black and white what do you like, think about <laughs> uh, the performances in this movie Performances, yeah. <laughs> performances air quotes air, podcast hey listeners. oscar isaac is a treasure <laughs> that man is a little mexican treasure yeah it's not a good movie it's not a good movie um, um this is only original movie too which is that's a bummer that's that doesn't <laughs> showcase well in that case let's move on to what we're all here for men of steel yeah um i'm wearing my superman shirt Uh-oh. superman I, I'm, I'm gonna go personal on you is one of my all-time favorite characters you know this because i've talked about it on Schmoes quite a bit right i love superman so much mm-hmm. like um batman superman and spider-man are the three comic book characters that have always been like the closest to like me and my family Mm. um so obviously the hype the hype rb3 it might be the it might still be one of the best trailers i've ever seen the man of steel trailer Mm -hmm. one of the greatest trailers i've ever seen in my life the han Han zimmer um, the han zimmer score is freaking flawless this movie had all the hype following the dark knight rises following the dark knight saga the trilogy, the, trilogy yeah. the thing that made it produced by christopher nolan mm-hmm. directed by Zack snyder this thing was supposed to be the greatest movie of all time did it do that for you no i didn't do it okay <laughs> it didn't do it for anyone but uh i'm i'm probably gonna be the one who defends man, man of steel the most i don't know how you feel about it but personally i feel like this movie gets way too much crap way too much crap like unnecessary crap i feel like uh, there is a lot that doesn't work in this movie but i feel like there's more that does work in this movie starting with first and foremost henry cavill as clark kent slash superman i think he's great i think he fits the role perfectly i think the only reason why this movie doesn't fall apart is because of him because he's it's one of those things where i remember watching this movie for the first time with my mom and like renting the movie and it's always fun kind of showing a movie to my mom but because my mom has a very different perspective she doesn't have the usual fanboy perspective or like i grew up with these characters perspective because she doesn't she didn't grow up with it she doesn't care um and my favorite thing my mom said after the movie was okay so superman talked like twice in this movie and it's like i was like yo mic drop because it's true he doesn't really have a lot to say in this movie he's mainly just reacting to scenarios that kind of come up to him but you don't really dive into the character he he finds out who he is he freaks out and then zod's trying to blow up the planet and the rest is like an hour and a half of 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 action scenes Mm -hmm. um which is cool but it, it could have been so much more. I, at least I feel. But to be fair, I put this movie above pretty much every DCU new movie, to be honest. I put it above BBS. I put it above Suicide Squad. Above Wonder Woman? I put it probably above Wonder Woman, yeah. Yeah, sorry, Wonder Woman. I probably put this above Wonder Woman, yeah. Because to me, there is so much that works with this movie. The the Smallville stuff works for me. The, the Clark Kent stuff works for me. Um, 
the him the being Krypton Superman, stuff, the I Krypton would. stuff is great. Mm. Um, it, it, there's so much that works in this movie. Henry Cavill, again, I can't talk enough about how much I like this version of Superman as far as Henry Cavill. And a lot of people were saying, that's not Superman. Superman's not supposed to be dark and gritty and, and color contrasted. And he's supposed to be light and fun and cracking jokes. And I'm like, mm, is it? Or is that just Christopher Reeves that you're thinking of? Because a lot of people mistake christopher reeves as the defi- the definite superman mm-hmm. and 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 that could be your superman but to me it's like saying that that superman is like such a small minded point of view and i'm not saying that the Zack snyder superman is the incumbent superman i've always said and i've talked to you about superman quite a oh, bit yeah. all-star superman that's my yes. superman that's that. superman and just if you want to see a superman that's superman right there mm-hmm. and there's so many great superman movies uh, animated movies superman versus the elite all-star superman uh superman batman public public enemies is another good one um there's uh superman uh, apocalypse superman and batman apocalypse uh to me superman can be so much more uh, superman the animated series holy crap yeah so, uh freaking his performance in justice league like the way they show superman in justice league that's superman mm-hmm. and maybe he doesn't really hit it on the nose in this movie but i feel like it gets close enough and i feel like people are so concerned about why wasn't there any jokes in the movie and why wasn't there blah 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 it should have been way lighter and the color was threw me off i'm fine with color who cares? I, I personally didn't care. And I didn't think it was as dark as people say it was. I think Zod was dark. I think the situation he is was dark. But I didn't think Henry Cavill Superman was dark. I didn't feel that at all. I just felt like he was reacting to the situation he was placed in. I don't know. I'm going on a rant right now. I want to hear your yeah. thoughts. No, I mean, I, I agree to some extent. I mean, I think this movie's okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't like love it. I don't hate it. Um, I think there's some things it does really well. I think as a movie that's like, oh, Here's what happens on Superman's first day of the job. Like I think that's really interesting. I think that's what Which where, is pretty much what this is. Yeah, and I think that's where it succeeds. Like, you know, of course he's gonna make mistakes. Of course he's gonna um, you know, accidentally tear down eleven hundred buildings, but um, <laughs> you, uh, dude, I got I gotta say this. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but as a DBZ fan, I'm yes, a huge, I, this is the this no, is the Dragon Ball Z yes. movie. This is a Dragon yes. Ball Z. As soon as I watched this, movie, I remember watching it in theaters. I remember <laughs> watching it in theaters. Yeah, and there was a scene in Smallville where where Superman is fighting uh, Feora and this big Kryptonian, mm-hmm. and it's literally Nappa and Vegeta. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. holy shit, yeah. that's Vegeta because he's little, and that's Nappa because he's big, and he's mm-hmm. fighting him in this super powered way. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is a Dragon Ball Z movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> this Yo. is literally a Dragon Ball Z this- movie. But as a Dragon Ball Z movie, I have to critique it because guess what? As someone who's a Dragon Ball Z fan, Goku always tells the person he's fighting, let's go where there's no people. And he flies away to mm-hmm. like an abandoned island. Mm-hmm. Goku always does that because he knows that if I fight someone, shit's about to blow up. Yeah. And I can't be anywhere near a city or people. So Goku, every time he fights someone in, in Dragon Ball Z, mm-hmm. he always flies away to some other planet or something. Or I mean, not another planet, but like another place where it's abandoned. Right. Superman, all he had to do was be like, yo, Zod, you want to fight? Let's take it outside, bro. Yeah. But let's not fight in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the whole time I was thinking, man, he's really... Ooh, Superman. Ooh, come on, man. That building. Oh, there goes a lot. There goes 12,000 people. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, there watching are, that. There's a lot of moments in that movie where kind of watching it again and again and again, I'm like, Superman could have made a really better choice here. Yeah, like, he really like, could I, I, it, For me in particular, it comes down to where he's fighting, what was it like the Earth the Earth Destroyer, right? The Earth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I where, forgot what it's called. Yeah. But he's he's like fighting the hands of it. And in my mind, I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be better if Superman went down and kind of caught all the jets that are flying in the buildings and stopping a little and like helping people through the wreckage like get out instead of fighting this thing uh, that's kind of what made that would make more sense to me um i think that's more of what would fa- fall in line with like a superman movie um but i mean that being said again it's to me it's like yes his first day on the job like hey, he he literally has to be thrown into the superman position and not having any idea of what that really means um and i think that's kind of like the foundational problem of this movie is it that is. He, there's no definition of the meaning of life. Um, where, as in the original 1978 Superman, it comes down to the foundation. Like with with Paul Kent dying in the original film. Um, in the original film, he dies from a heart attack, and 
you know, in that you kind of learn he that couldn't have stopped. He it couldn't have stopped it with so, all his powers. Yes, exactly, exactly. And you know, and that's a lesson he has to learn. Whereas in this movie, Paul he Kent c- dies. Could in, have stopped it in a, in a tornado easily. Yes, like I'm talking easily yeah he literally could have been like well all these people are gonna see me and they're like no they're not yeah. you can just make a tornado yourself you can just fly into the tornado and just be like it was the tornado you could go super speed and get uh, that that really did get me real mad like yeah. that that scene with pa kent the fact that he died like that it's not the fact that he died it's the mm. way he died that's right what, right I'm, I'm with you I, I really like him dying of of, of natural conditions right. because that's way more realistic that feels like like super, no matter how powerful Superman is, he couldn't have stopped that. That's straight out of Smallville too, like the right. TV show, like right. the the fact that Pa Kent dies like that too, and because it's like, and he says it in the show. He says like, you know, no matter what you could have, you couldn't have done it. No matter what you you try, you you couldn't have saved your dad. Right. Right, yeah. and I think that's what's important. I think that's what's missing in Man of Steel. So that's why when he is fighting zod he doesn't really have a concern of Human how to save life. all these people yeah. yeah because he he's never really been exposed to that and i think you know and of course that comes down again further down to the idea of paul kent telling a young superman not to save people of course to stay quiet but there's a an extra level of moral ambiguity and i think that's another consistent theme in Zack snyder's movies of like uh, is it really a good idea to save people when you could be outing yourself, exposing yourself? Um, is putting yourself out in the world really the best idea? That's the question of Watchmen, of whether or not the government should be um, censoring these superheroes. Or the question in, you know, even in Sucker Punch, which is not a good movie, but the whole idea of that is if you lock these girls away and, you know, take away their potential, um, they're, they're not going to you know, demonstrate that. Sure. So, um, but they have to overcome that themselves. And that's what Superman's arc is, is trying to overcome his own insecurities to become the hero that he's supposed to be. And, sure. um, uh, I think that that's kind of where the establishment of the movie, um, leads into a lot of the big problems that a lot of people have with it. Um, but going off for the movie that we have, I think it was done really well. You know, I think the sure. uh, where the emotional arc that they're going for is conveyed um, to to the extent it's not the emotional arc that I wanted or I think fits well in the Superman movie. Uh, but I think that's what they were going for, and I think they did that well. Sure. Um, even down to having the decision to have to kill Zod. Um, you know, so I think to me that's where uh, the importance of that movie. Uh, lies is that it might have not been necessarily the quote unquote best Superman movie, no. um, but it was on its own the story that I was trying to tell this post nine eleven this post terrorist terrorism movement uh, the a- the fear of aliens and alien and the fears of uh, not ours the others sure. um, is conveyed really well in this so I think that's what they're going for yeah and and again to me that that relies a lot on on Henry Cavill's Superman I feel like it, his Superman does work but I feel like it would have been way better if we could dive into his character I feel like he he just doesn't get enough to do he doesn't get enough to say enough to to evolve we're not clear of his motivations yeah we're not clear of his goals absolutely that's the thing that gets me because i feel like if we did that we this movie would have been great would have worked perfectly yeah. but the fact that we don't get that it, it just disconnects with a lot of audiences but i do prefer it over batman versus superman which oh, is let's yeah. get to this movie because this movie i rewatched this one again as well um falls apart for me quite a bit quite a bit but to be honest rb3 the reason why this movie falls apart for me besides one ginormous thing that i've talked about for years Mm. is besides that i'll get to that but let's get to the reason why i think the movie falls apart in general batfleck oh you don't like batfleck i don't like batfleck I, i think batfleck doesn't work i think his motivation in this movie doesn't make sense I think the way they portray it doesn't make sense. I think the way Batman nonchalantly kills people doesn't make sense. I think nothing to me for, for Batman's characterization, and I know everyone's so in love with him, but I, I just didn't. I felt like he was more of a dick. Not even a villain, just a dick. Like a douchebag. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm going to kill Superman. I'm going to show him my dick's bigger, bro. And I'm like, that's not Batman. That's never been Batman. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm going to show him because, you know, he killed all those people. And I'm like, who is this? This isn't, and he's working out to get ready to fight Superman. And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I didn't care for it at all. To me, everything that does work is Superman. 
Uh, see, I'm I'm almost the exact opposite. That's incredible. To me. Yeah, I want to hear your thoughts because that to me is baffling. <laughs> yeah. So so for me, besides besides the fact that we're not even going to talk about, well, we probably will, but the worst casting decision in the history of anything I've ever seen is Jesse Eisenberg's Lex, <laughs> Lex Luthor. He's literally playing Jim Carrey's The Riddler. He's playing Jim Carrey's The Riddler in this movie as a Lex Luthor. Yeah. It is the worst. It takes you, it sucks you out of the movie. It black holes you out of the movie. Like a black hole sucking you and breaking you down into tiny little particles. That's what Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor does in this movie. It is so bad. <laughs> oh, 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 oh my. Oh, two people getting together. Oh, I love bringing people together oh my he's not it's not a bad because intelligence isn't right i'm like what are you doing dude? he's playing like a weird version of a jim carrey i hated it so much and i'm i just told you how much i love lex and we saw lex yeah. in Watchmen. yeah that's lex luther <laughs> that's who lex is that's the lex that i've grown up with yeah what we saw on bbs was not lex luther right i'll let you get to uh batfuck <laughs> right no i mean to me to me uh I think you're kind of right. I think it is a departure from what we see as our conventional Batman. Sure. But I think it's the adaptation of the Frank Miller Batman, right? And Frank Miller is... But if every time someone brings up the Frank Miller, man, I'm telling you, that Superman isn't Superman. Well, Frank that's, Miller that's my that problem. Superman yeah. is, is pl- it, the, that Superman in, in the Frank M- Miller novel is a villain. He's like a, yeah. a little well, puppy, lapdog puppy yeah. of, of Nixon. And he's like well, a little... Yeah. He, he's just... That's not... Superman. Well, that's where that's where I'm. I'm going to talk about that too, like kind of why this movie doesn't work. Sure. Um, and that's a big part of it. But I'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, to me, th- they were adapting that. They're adapting that Batman though. The idea of this, and you know, when you follow Frank Miller, a lot of his ideology kind of comes down to like the individualist, like the idea of somebody who is so gun hole on his own. Um, self-righteousness and that, morals yeah and morals that is gonna either destroy them or make them great and that's the character we see in 300 that's the character we see um in all of frank miller's writing frankly and that's especially the character we see in the dark knight returns um which is what they're basing it off of the older batman the uh, you know the the you know kind of out of retirement the the lost robin all of the all these different aspects and factors that go into it but long story short, I think that's where the film kind of gets its footing is from this uh, Frank Miller kind of Anne Ranian like super machismo Batman going up against somebody like Superman who has to coming off of something like Man of Steel where like he's being condemned by the government. He's on he's basically like on the run the whole time. Um but he, he does have to, but when he comes in to answer for his uh for his uh, potential you know, crime pre- for his yeah for his potential crimes um you know we see that whole exp- so we n- never get a cathartic and I, I think that's the overarching problem in this movie it's filled with a lot of big moments um a lot of big set pieces a lot of big scenes um but ultimately it's like we never get a sense of actual resolution to any of that um you know when superman has to talk to congress um do we really get an answer to his moral position on that no the, the place explodes um do you know when when something like he goes to save lois lane and he saves lois um you know he he obviously splashes that one dude through a bunch of walls um and whatnot so it's like uh, like there's not and that's that's the end of that scene. And then we come back to that scene uh, much later, and we realize that oh, all of those dudes died, <laughs> they just got killed. So it's like whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, but he didn't kill them. Yeah, he didn't kill them. Yeah. But like the fact that he let that happen, or the fact that we don't even know what happens, is like yo, what the like can't like we have to finish? You know, we have to get some sort of. So that's kind of and and again, when adapting the Frank Miller novel, that's where. The real conflict, the, you see why that conflict makes sense. Why Batman wants to fight Superman. Uh, Superman is... In rep- this movie, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, because you don't... It makes zero sense. And, and, and it frustrates me so bad that people are like, it totally makes sense. Superman destroyed all the... No, he didn't. He really didn't. I mean, it, it, that to me is so baffling that it, one of my least favorite lines in the movie, he's like, we got to kill them because because if, if there's a 1% chance he's evil, then we got to f- murder this guy. And I'm like, no, that makes no sense. Well, see, and that's where... That's where the political divide in this movie comes in right because what 
what and it, this comes from adapting the Dark Knight Returns as well. The idea of that Batman is that he's self righteous. He's on his own. He wants to be an individual. You know, he is kind of. And again, this is going to offend a lot of people. I don't want to offend anybody. This is what I read into the film. This, you know, this Batman is kind of like the right wing kind of center of the film. Sure. Right. His whole arc is that he is he wants to be on his own. No government. Nobody watching after him. He, he wants to do his own thing. He's going to brand people. It doesn't matter if they get killed or not. He has his own agenda. Whereas the what superman in the comic book was supposed to represent is the government the the demo, the the uh democracy um he is working for the government he he's fighting for the greater good the collective the people um and that is more of what the you know and and frank miller i think even frank miller missed this himself is really the ideological conflict in that is right versus left and that's where and and, and that's where the, the 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 novel falls apart for me too and i know everyone loves this dark knight returns and yeah. it's great it's a great batman story it's a terrible superman story yeah it's one of the it's not it's just it's a it's a caricature of superman yeah and that that for me is why uh, the idea of even adapting this in the first place i just want to make this clear i just named two superman movies that are really really freaking good where he's co-starring with batman what people don't get is that superman and batman are the greatest duo and superhero connection ever i'm mm -hmm. talking ever watch superman and batman public enemies watch superman and batman apocalypse these these are two characters that do butt heads but always find a center ground whereas like this made no sense to me where all batman needed to do was have a two-minute conversation with the guy to be like oh your mom's in trouble oh crap why didn't you tell me Dude, I've been trying to tell you for the last 20 minutes, but you started beating my face with kryptonite. Right. He's like, yeah, but you could have told me that your mom's in trouble. It's like, really? Like, that's what it is? Like, that to me just took me out because all it was was a two-second conversation where Lois Lane is like, no, his mom's in trouble. What? Why didn't he say anything? Well, because you were beating his face. Right. Like, that to me was just like... Well, see, and <sighs> I, I think that is why... The, that's why that's, the, the, that's why to me yeah. batman is like such a dick in this movie i'm like dude die seriously you're not batman you right. suck <laughs> well i think i think see see that's where see that's where the frank miller influence comes in right yeah if, if batman is this hard on uh like this this man this machismo this um individual who stands by nobody's ground who, who does this of course he's going to have an ideological conflict with somebody who's more for the who's more for the people more for saving the world more for humanity more for the government um in the book that makes sense and you know and of course somebody who's so hot-headed and you know this the, the book was kind of rated in a divisive time but i think this movie could have really played on that the sort of ideological division that's happening in the country right now this movie could have played on that but instead they have to go with the stupid oh his mom's being kidnapped this and that you're right that could have been sorted out in two it could have been sorted out in two seconds they hey 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 bruce uh my mom yeah her name's martha she's she's being taken by lex <laughs> yeah. right now um i just i want to let you know right now that he's pinning us against each other but yes. in real life like my mom's about to be killed you mind helping me out Oh, dude, yeah, for sure. Whereas the ideological, the ideological differences alone could have prompted a, a, a decent fight if they would have explored that further. But instead, they have to set up for the franchises. They have to set up for the you know the next movies and all of this. And you know, we can't really have Batman and Superman be mad at each other. Um, the idea of unity is so far out for these producers or whoever or whoever wrote the script or or even maybe even schneider like the idea of unifying these two warring ideologies is so far out that they couldn't even think like to me that would make that would make it a, a decent ending sure if if like if they were if if they had this big great uh, ideological difference and how that comes to divide them and how that comes to um you know um, make that fight, but if they were to stand together in unity and not to fight some goddamn, you know, bone, you know, like doomsday, the doomsday, yeah, the, Kryptonian, yeah, yeah, not to do that, but to 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 actually have an understanding, to reason with each other. I think that would have been a lot more, you know. But again, this is a superhero movie. This is something that they got to sell to audiences. And the fact of the matter is, I guess you can't really have Batman and Superman fight because they have different ideas of saving the world. They have to fight because uh, they their mother. 
one's one's mother is in is in trouble. So yeah, but that um, that, that to me even didn't. I know a lot of people always joke about Martha. That that to me didn't even. To me, I was like, that's fine. That makes sense to me as far as like. Uh, I I can't excuse that man. No, I'm not excusing. <laughs> I'm not excuse. The way it was done was poorly done. I agree with that. But the reasoning behind it, I get what they were going for. I get that it's the whole idea of like, hey, you know, I have a mom too. She's in trouble. That whole thing of like playing into the the mother concept, the idea of someone in trouble, the idea of um the, the, being related to humanity by the one thing that connected you to your own humanity right i get it i just didn't like how it was done I, one two i didn't like how that whole entire martha thing could have been done 20 minutes before they even got into a fight yeah that, well i yeah i mean the 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 to me, again i think that's where the movie like messes up if they would have had the ideological war instead of having the mother there that would have made it a lot better and plus the whole idea of of superman is that he is a um at least our traditional sense of superman is that he is a man trying to grapple with um trying to he is a he is a alien trying to grapple with the world um with humanity with humanity right? yeah um but in this movie is so much about him being only about lois and only about his mother that frankly when really not even about his mother when his mother gets kidnapped he hasn't even noticed right so it's like it's so much about being his relationship with Lois that you know and even um Martha Kent had that whole conversation with him is like you can either be the hero for the people or just be the hero for you um and that is where I think the movie you know kind of falls apart and sleeps on itself you know because if it's Superman it should be about the humanity. Batman is about himself. That's what Batman is. Sure. Superman should be about the people. And, sure. you know, of course, that's going to be a continuing arc from the first Man of Steel where he has that question up front. But if his whole MO in this movie was about, oh, I'm not fucking bored, you know, saving people. You know, I'm not like hauling ships looking, you know, depressed, you know, if if. If they would have locked that down, and again, they could have locked that down in Man of Steel with um, having, you know, uh, you know, with him having a, a better understanding of humanity through his relationship with Paul Kent, and that could have been further emphasized in this movie. But it tends, to, it it just switches to the other direction where he is, uh, where where Paul Kent has another scene with him where he's like, "Oh yeah, I saved myself, um, I saved myself in my town, in my in my farm," but the the stream went to another village and ended up flooding a whole bunch of other people but it's just it's okay because i met your mother you know what what is that what you're teaching superman uh, i don't think that's what he says that, that's right. that, that's the, that's almost that's damn he, near he quote. says he says that the dreams the nightmare stopped when i met your mother because yeah. she taught me about humanity so that what, why are you teaching superman this why is why are you telling the most powerful figure on the planet like what are you doing so then so and that's why when he sacrifices himself at the end he's, is he just sacrificing himself for lois that doesn't make sense if he he's sacrificing himself for both rb3 lois and humanity at the same time he says i need to save the world and she says, don't do it. And, she, and he says, you are my world. Get it? It's both at the same time. <laughs> pick, it, pick, it, pick a side. This is, what, this is what I'm saying. Like, people, you have, to, you have to, when it comes to having a movie that's so focused on an ideological difference, a character has to pick a side. You have to pick a side. And there's no side for Superman. Uh, we get the side for Batman. But uh, either his side I, doesn't make a lot of sense. So I, I, don't I don't know, man. To me, to me, I, I feel like at least Superman was trying. I feel like Batman was just a dick. Um, <laughs> it just didn't work for me. And also, I feel like Superman just gets so much shade from the writers and from the producers. And well, they're like, they, just, they're they don't like, know what to do with yeah, him. They're, they're just like, like let's have Superman go over here and do this. And then Batman get really mad at him and then get, have a Batman workout scene. And I'm like, what? No. Instead of that Batman workout scene, have another scene with Superman. When we get to know more about him. And I, I don't know. And but. I think that's also, you know, I think Nerd Right, I keep referencing Nerd Right because I'm just sure. a big fan of that guy. But he has a great video on how in Batman v Superman, you never get an established moment with Superman. You when never do. It's we, very true. Like, they, I think there's, you know, we visit like the Daily Planet eight times. And the longest scene that's there is a, is a, 
like one minute and 30 seconds yeah like that that's the problem you know it is a huge Sp- problem spend time developing superman before the- you show us batman and jerk off to batman yeah um but but uh speaking of that um no offense to snyder by the way i think i think i think what at least i will commend batman v superman for trying to be different sure. and trying to be his own thing and trying to do something new with the genre and deconstruct his heroes but to be honest i i feel like I just don't like Ben Affleck. I mean, I like Ben Affleck, but I feel like Ben Affleck really pulled his own weight in this movie. And if you guys don't think he's the kind of guy to do that, trust me, he is. He is definitely the kind of guy to be like, uh-uh, I want this in the movie. Uh-uh, I want to do this. Oh, uh-uh, I got to have this too. And he's like totally the kind of guy to do that. Um, also, real quick, uh, before we close up shop, um, is we, we're still good? Yeah, we're good. Cool. Yeah. Um, does it make any sense if you're going to have a super mech suit to work out with weights and and do like a bunch of squats that makes zero sense zero <laughs> sense if you're inside an iron man suit that gives you super strength why are you exhausting your muscles if you're gonna be inside an actual mech suit that gives you that super strength that is the dumbest thing i've ever heard and i don't care what people say because that makes zero sense it's a Zack snyder movie you have to have a training montage that makes you have but, but to have a training if you're gonna montage. have a training match have him sprint have him do some laps but do weights as if he's okay you got to be the man Ace. You but if man. he's working out with those weights he's not going to get any stronger because he's inside the same suit that gives him the same amount of strength either way if i was inside the suit i would still be insane. Oh, i don't know i'm gonna stop that didn't make any sense i'm sorry <laughs> and the whole ben affleck body double didn't work for me either because that's not ben affleck i don't care what anyone says <laughs> that was our episode up no, i'm kidding <laughs> um let's get some questions real quick before yeah. we close up shop um there was only a few uh twitter questions by I, the way I people out. people we get the martha scene okay i don't need to see a 12 paragraph essay about oh i get uh, it trust yeah, me we, we all oh, get it, it. I, we, I, I, I it makes sense it just wasn't framed right there is a nice cut on YouTube that somebody did like the same scene but with the music from the uh, Dark Knight trilogy from like the Hans Zimmer music. Yeah. That was nice. That was nice. <laughs> uh, alrighty. Let's say this. Dylan Langes says, I think his films are gorgeous but often lack a story. I do love the weirdness of Sucker Punch though, even though it's not a great film. There's your Sucker Punch shout out, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Not a fan of Sucker Punch, so. <laughs> uh, Kristen Smith says, what do you guys, oh, shout out to Kristen, by the way. I met her at, um, earlier this week. Um, what do you, what do you both think about his progression as a director? Personally, I like his earlier stuff as he makes more movies. I've been less and less happy with his work. Um, I think she's mainly referring to Dawn of the Dead and maybe 300. 300, yeah. And probably Watchmen, too, maybe. Dead, yeah. Um, but, of course, now he's become so embroiled in the DC cinematic uni- or DC expanded universe um, that, you know, that's a lot of where his work is going now. So. I mean, to be to be fair to him, he, he him and his wife, Deborah Snyder, created the DC cinematic right. universe. Right. And, you know, I think it's funny, too, man. I think if Man of Steel would have really worked... I think it would have been all Chris Nolan's credit. Like everybody would have been like, Chris Nolan is a genius. He did it again. Um, but now that it doesn't work, everybody blames Snyder. You know? I, I, like, I 100% agree. Uh, Sam Delano says visuals are probably Snyder's greatest strength in filmmaking. Besides that, what do you think are his other strengths? Well, I think his whole uh, approach to a hero, even though it doesn't necessarily work for Superman, and I believe. Batman versus Superman, but his whole approach of having to make a choice, having to, uh, you know, the plight of a hero, the sacrifice of a hero, um, and how that impacts um, a lot of the hero's journey and the hero's story. I think that's incredible. Um, I think he does that really well. Um, But however, when when it comes to, uh, you know, some of his films or some of his characters that are pre-established it doesn't necessarily work but again i think that's his biggest strength is his focus on the hero and how we could get into the hero and and relate to him uh final one danny allen shout out to danny allen says do you accept do you accept zaddy as our lord and savior oh no (laughs) it has a picture of uh that's uh zach snyder zach snyder jesus with spielberg and nolan (laughs) fincher is down there kevin feige is down there (laughs) yeah that's Um, a good meme that is a good meme i haven't seen that meme do you accept? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. With that, that was our episode on Zack Snyder. Make sure you guys comment. Leave a leave a comment. Leave a question. What is your favorite Zack Snyder film? What do you think about his filmmaking? What do you think about his visuals? Um, what do you think about the current DCEU? Do you think he gets too much credit? Do you 
think he doesn't get enough credit, let us know in the comments down below. I'm sure the comments are going to be great in this video because oh, yeah. I love you guys and I feel like you guys are going to leave great comments. Anyways, I am Ace. This is RB3. And we are peacing out from the Mini Enough Podcast. Peace out, guys. Zack Snyder for life.